Good morning, all. Can you all hear us in Alabama? Yeah. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So um, let me introduce everyone. So my name is Wayne Fagan, and I'm chair of uh, D. Howard International Education Foundation. And uh, the program uh, today, by the way, whoever whoever moved their laptop um, oh, monitor, uh, now we can't see the kids. Now we can. Great. The stars of the show. And and we have with, with us Swift School uh, in Alabama. Welcome all from Swift School. Thank you for being with us. And as I said, I'm Wayne Fagan, chair of uh, D. Howard International. And we have with us on our screen, I'll go from uh, left to uh, uh, top left. Uh, we have Carlos Velez, who will be our monitor our, our moderator, I should say, and moder and mo monitor for this uh, program. And Carlos is with the uh, University of Texas at San Antonio, uh, shorthand UTSA, at the Cleese College of Engineering and Integrated Design. And then myself, who's speaking now. Uh, and then also to the right is uh, Jill Ford, also of Cleese College, and, and she will we'll give some uh, welcoming remarks. They are our partners on these virtual presentations. And we have our star today, uh, Mr. Joel Grime of uh, uh, MIT, uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technologies. Beaverworks program, and uh, Joel is going to uh, uh, speak with us uh, uh, today. And then we have uh, the students on two monitors. Actually, one monitor is is uh, we can see you on one monitor, and there we can see uh, Heather's classroom on another monitor, and we see a big monitor on the wall. Yay! Anyhow, so when you're not, uh, I would ask that when you're not uh, speaking, if you'd mute your mic and uh, we'll, uh, uh, Joel, we'll talk till, do the presentation till about 10 after the hour and leave about 20 minutes for Q&A with the students if, if that works or if there's more time, there's more time. So Jill, would you like to make some welcoming remarks on behalf of your a uh, great institution. Yes, thank you so much, Wayne. Hi, everyone. I'm Jill Ford, Assistant Dean for Student Hi. Success in the Kalesi College of Engineering and Integrated Design. And we're just so happy to be a partner with the D. Howard International Education Foundation on the Rural STEM Initiative. And so really so happy to have Swift School with us. Hi, everybody there. Good to have you all. Good to see you all. Um, and thank you again, obviously, to, to Joel and to MIT Beaverworks. And uh, just really happy to be part of this partnership. Thank you, Jill. So Carlos, uh, I'll turn it over to you and, and Joel and I'll go on mute. Perfect, perfect. Um, yeah, so welcome everybody. So we're gonna go ahead and get started with our presentation. So uh, um, with this, Joel, you can pull up your, your slides and everything you have. Um, Joel, as we have said, uh, uh, Wayne just introduced a little bit ago, works uh, at MIT Beaver, works as a facility manager. So I'll pass it over to him to introduce himself and, and get us started. So thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. I am so happy to be here today and is so excited to talk to you guys. I'm hoping that by the end of the presentation, you've got a lot of questions and that you've learned a little bit about optics. So that's what my talk is about optics, as you can see there. Um, just a little bit about my, as, as I like to call it, my uh, ray trace, um, which is an optics joke there. Uh, from where I grew up. I grew up in rural Illinois. Um, that's where I started. And that's the house where I grew up in. I used to joke with uh, my friends out here out east that I didn't actually need weatherman because I would just look to the west and I could see tomorrow's weather. So that's that's how flat it was in that part of Illinois. So, But from there, from uh, Hinkley, Illinois, I went to Rochester, the University of Rochester in New York State, where I met my wife. And uh, from there, we moved out to Boston, where I got a job at MIT Lincoln Laboratory. 
So after working at MIT Lincoln Laboratory, and I've been there for over 35 years now. Yes, I'm that old. Um, I've worked on a lot of different projects, all optics related, almost all optics related, from building laser radars, from building uh, camera systems, infrared cameras, lots of different fun things that I've done. Uh, but now what I'm doing is I'm working at MIT, where I'm mentoring uh, college students in how to do engineering, as well as managing high school programs like the one you see in the picture here. There I am down at the bottom here from a program that we run just last summer, uh, where we had, uh, this is just some of the students, we had over 400 students from high school attend our program, both virtually and at MIT, um, learning some really cool stuff about computer science, about autonomous systems, about lots of engineering topics. So we have lots of programs that we're running for high school students. Um, and I'm hoping that I see a bunch of you guys uh, eventually at Beaverworks and uh, in our programs. So with that short introduction, right? What is optics, right? So I'm gonna ask you guys a question and uh, I can see you guys in the video here a little bit. And what the question I have for you is, is light a particle or a wave? I don't know, does anybody have any ideas? If it's a particle, raise your hand. Got a couple of hands. If it's, is, if it's a wave, can you raise your hand? Okay. Okay, good. Good. So I'm not going to read the official definition. We're just going to move on to talk about the different fields of optics and what things can do. And hopefully we'll have some fun along the way. There we go. Oh, too slow. There we go. So um, what is light, right? Light really is energy, right? Different colors have different energies. So here's all the colors that you can see, right? We can all see a rainbow of colors from blue to red. Um, engineers have to be very precise. And so they tend to put a label on things. Uh, in this case, blue light or vultural, uh, violet light are, is about 450 nanometers. If you could measure a nanometer, it'd be very, very tiny, right? And uh, But the difference between blue light and red light is really the wavelength of its light, wavelength of its um, uh, frequency. So it goes from about 450 to 750 nanometers. That's a very short range when you think about all the, the whole electromagnetic spectrum. It's very wide, but what we can see is just a very tiny bit of that. And why is that? It's because that's what comes through from the sun, right? Here is the spectrum of the sun coming out from uh, every day, 24 hours a day, the sun is emitting this kind of light. And as you can see here from our little rainbow, right? Here's the spectrum that comes to the atmosphere. And whether it's a coincidence or not, we can discuss that later, that's a different discussion, but that's how our eyes have developed to be able to see light around us, right? We looked at the peak of the spectrum from the sun and that's what our eyes see, red, green, blue, mainly, and, and, that's how it works, right? That's how eyes work. That's really the basic of the field of optics is how your eye works and what we can do with light. So a lot of different things, a lot of fun things. And I'm gonna talk about the eye a little bit, right? Because then we're gonna do some fun things about how you can fool your eye and your brain a little bit for things that are happening. So so eyes, eyes are really um, your, your window to the world, right? But cameras, everybody have seen cameras, whether it's a cell phone camera or a larger uh, camera that you hold, right? Those cameras are all based on your eye. Um, there's a little aperture in your camera, which is here in your eye, it's called a pupil. Um, and that kind of expands and contracts based on how dark or light it is. Um, there's a lens, we'll talk a lot more about lenses here in a few minutes, but that lens actually focuses the things that you see in front of you onto the back of your eye called the retina. The retina has what's called rods and cones. Rods and cones are the little detectors that say, hey, a photon hit me or a piece of wavelength hit me, a lot, some light hit me, and I'm gonna detect that and send a signal to my brain. Uh, interesting side note, right? The image on your eye here is actually upside down and your brain turns it right side up. I'll talk about that in a minute too, but that's really cool. And the fact that your eye is biological, there are things that it does to make it work very well for us. 
uh, as we go around our daily lives, but then we can, can make up things that actually fool your eye and fool your brain. But this is really how the eye works with the uh, lens, focusing all that light onto the back of your eye. And then the image is what your brain sees and processes for stuff. So first test, right? When you look at this image, do you see white dots and black dots, right? If you look in the and at one of the corners, right, then there are black dots around the other areas of your uh, in that screen, right? That's a very specific effect based on the fact that your eye is processing that data and it tries to fill in that information. So this one is actually okay. It's kind of neat to stare at it long enough and you kind of see what's going on there. And it's because of the, some of the effects that the cells in your eye talk to each other and they kind of cancel each other out. So this one's even more fun. This is gonna be a video. It's gonna play and then I'm gonna stop. When I stop the video, I want you to turn and look at the person next to you. And then it's gonna be funny to see what happens. So I'm gonna play the video. When I stop the video, turn and look at somebody next to you. Okay, here we go. I'm not trying to hypnotize anyone. I'm counting off for a few more seconds here. Okay, now turn and look to that the person next to you. What do you see? Do you see their head shrinking? Does it look like the things are compressing? That is an optical illusion caused by the fact that your eyes are used to processing that swirling data. And because your eye, try, your eye and your brain tries to cancel out that information, right? Then it, it continues to process that information as you stare at something else. And that's what makes your head kind of shrink after you look at this. And uh, I think that's a lot of fun to do when you do this. And we'll have another one later. We, in fact, here's an, well, we're gonna go to the next slide. So here's another one. We're gonna stare at the cross in the center of the screen. And you can see right now, we all see little purple dots on the screen, right? And as we see these purple dots, we're gonna see them start to move. The purple dots won't actually move, they'll disappear. But if you stare at that center long enough, you guys are gonna to have to tell me what you see um, when you stare at that screen, right at the center of the screen. So stare at the center of the screen, right at that cross. And if you stare at it long enough, I want, uh, if, we, uh, if Heather can unmute, I wanna hear what students are saying. So if this is working for you guys, right? And if you stare at that dot long enough, then the purple dots are gonna eventually disappear and all you'll see is a floating green disc that goes oh. around. Are you seeing the green dot? Yeah. Yeah. Believe it or not, there's no green dot. This is not uh, a green dot moving around or taking over, right? There's always only the purple dots there, right? And the fact that much like an after image, when you stare at a very bright light, your eye saturates and then it tries to fill in an information. And because the opposite of purple is that green, right? Your eye then fills in the missing spot with green. And so eventually you start to see that green dot going around in the circle instead of disappearing purple dots. But that, have, that kind of reinforces the fact that your eye, um, your, the cells at the back of your eye saturate. And when they saturate, they start to fill in other information. So that's what's fun about this little video, the fact that there's no green dot, there's only purple dots. And it's your eye and the rest of your brain uh, filling in those gaps. All right, next slide. Okay, one more test. Um, that black line lines up 
with the blue or the red line? Which one does it line up with? And you don't have to unmute, but just think in mind, keep in, keep in mind here as, I, as we go. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna find out, is it line up with the blue or the red? That lines up with the red. Okay, it sounds like some people got it right. So the uh, part of the... <laughs> I think, okay, part of the effect that you're seeing here is that your eye kind of says there is a, something breaking in the middle here. And so it starts to, this is how I'm going to talk about refraction, right? Refraction is another very important part of uh, optical engineering or optics in general. And your eye's trying to fill that in because your brain knows that something's going on. And so it tries to straighten it out. Um, just like that picture of the pencil and the glass of water, because light is refracting, it makes it look bent. And your eye, your eye knows that, your brain knows that, and so it tries to straighten it out again. So the really important thing about refraction is that when you go from something like air, which is a very low index of refraction, to water or glass or other materials, that's got a higher index of refraction, the light will bend, right? Engineers are funny because they like to be very precise. Um, and so they have a name for almost everything, right? You've got this angle of incidence, which is the ray of light coming in. And then you've got the angle of refraction, which is that light bends based when it goes through that higher index material, whether it's glass or water or anything else. And this is really important when it comes to lenses and other optic devices, uh, because unless that light bends right you don't get any effect just go straight and if it goes straight then there's not much you can do with it so how does a lens work right well it's based on that refraction right you've got a curved surface um, and that curved surface the light bends different ways um, all along the surface of that lens and eventually you'll they all converge to a new spot after that lens and like i said the really neat thing is that your object or the person standing in front of that lens is standing up, but the image is upside down, just like it is on the back of your eye and your brain turns it right side up. So, but, uh, so this is a very simple lens, right? Um, and, you know, there are simple lenses like this or like this, and it's fun to like play with lenses, right? There we go. Now you've got a magnified image of my eye. But uh, that's a simple lens, right? And I think, I'm sure that some of you have eyeglasses just like I do. That's how those work, right? The fact that the light is refracting as it goes to the lens and forming a new image after it, right? That's really the basic of a lot of optical elements, uh, basic optics. So. so why are binoculars, why are my binoculars so complicated? You've got a bunch of lenses here. You've got prisms here that bend the light around. And you got more lenses here. Why is that? Well, the important thing to note is, is that the, it's complicated because not all light bends the same way, right? Um, red light bends a little less than blue light. And so when it goes to the lens, it tends to separate out, like you see in this picture of a prism, right? White light is, has lots of different colors in it. There's lots of different energy wavelengths in it. Um, and how do you separate those out? Sometimes you can do it on purpose with a prism, but most of the time when you've got like your glasses, you don't want that to happen, right? You want to have all the light lined up. Um, and then, so you've got a nice pic picture to look at, right? That's really important. And so a lot of optical engineering goes to making those colors come back together so that you've got a good image, a good camera lens, whether it's on your phone or like on my computer or anything else that you've got, like a telescope or microscope for that matter, right? It's really important to have those colors all together. So uh, the other term for separating those colors out are chromatic aberrations. That's what a lot of lens design, designed for lenses like microscopes, uh, try to get rid of. They try to get rid of those aberrations that, and keep the colors together. So in some cases, it's a benefit to us, right? How does a rainbow form, 
right? It's exactly that issue. The fact that colors don't refract the same way. Um, uh, the different colors lights don't refract the same way. And so here's a picture of a very large raindrop. And that large raindrop shows you how the colors get separated. Because the light comes in, they start to separate out because of the differences of refraction in the raindrop. And by the time it bounces back out again, their lights are separated out. And uh, when you're standing farther away, uh, you see a rainbow, which is what you see here. I, I really like this picture that I took over the summer. Uh, that's actually me standing there. That's uh, my shadow standing there taking that picture with my iPhone um, and shows uh, the rainbow along with a little close up of what the rainbow looks like. So. And this is, you know, if you look around you, there are rainbows all over the place. There is light refracting and separating out into different colors. Um, and you just have to be on the look for it. I think for schools, whether you're in Alabama or Massachusetts or Illinois or Texas, right? You're going to see a rainbow someday if you haven't already. And it's really important to just keep an eye out. Look for observations. Look for rainbows. Because ice crystals also do that. You see... Um, Ice crystals in the sky uh, from very high clouds will sometimes do that. You'll see there's a, a phenomenon called sun dogs. Sun dogs are um, essentially reflections of the sun that are small rainbows off to the sides of the sun, uh, as particularly when it's setting, it's something to see it. Sometimes you can see halos around the sun um, if there's some la la high, thin clouds. And those halos are also caused by refraction. So Refractions everywhere. You got. It. I want you guys to keep an eye out for it, just in case you see it. So it's really fun to see. That's what got me interested in optics. Actually, is looking at these various things in the air. All right, the halos around the sun, the sun dogs in the afternoon, rainbows. What causes those? That's what got me questioning what goes on with optics. So, so I'm going to ask people again now: Is light a wave or a particle? So, who thinks it's a wave now? Did I change anybody's mind? I see a couple of hands up. Excellent. Okay. Okay. So now I'm going to confuse everybody and talk about why light is a particle. So um, I think we're doing good on time here. So incandescent bulbs. So you don't see many of these anymore. But the point I want to make here is that when something glows really, really hot, it glows. And there's a term for that called black body radiation. Again, here, engineers like to have specific terms for things. But in this case, the fact that it glows, it emits light, right? That's where the phrase white hot comes from, right? When something is really, really hot, it glows and it emits light. But there's another way that things emit light too. And that's really more of a quantum mechanics, atomic level type thing. So I talked about how light is also energy, right? You've got a model of electrons here spinning around a nucleus of an atom. Sometimes those electrons um, have a little bit more energy. And when they have a little bit more energy, sometimes they jump back down to a lower energy state. And when they do that, they emit a photon. That's how LEDs work. That's how your monitors work that you're looking at. That's how projectors work um, most of the time. There are some exceptions to that. That's how lasers work, right? Uh, atom has electrons and those electrons go from a higher energy state to a lower energy state. And when they go to that lower energy state, they emit a photon. And that photon is what we see with our eyes. So that's yeah, very cool to know that there's more than one way to uh, make light. Um, and a lot of our modern displays all work this way, whether it's a semiconductor LED or the light on the projector or a light on your TV monitor. Um, that's how they work. Those electrons are going from a higher energy state to a lower energy state, and they emit light. And that's how that works. So everybody sees a daisy, right? Because we're all looking at a display, a digital display that's made up of pixels. I'll talk about what pixels are here, right? So this is what a computer is doing, right? Behind the scenes, there are lots and lots of numbers. And that's what the computer uses to build that image, right? Uh, a computer doesn't see light, not really, uh, unless it's got a detector on it, but it's gotta have a way to digitize that data. 
And that digital data, then you count up how many electrons are in it. And now you've got a number. Once you've got a number, then the computer transmits that, sends it as a file, sends it as a video or however it sends it. And then it starts to reassemble it back into an image. So this is what we see. This is what we see on a projector or a display. This is what the computer sees, right? The computer sees numbers. All it sees is numbers. And so this is a quick test. Here's an image, right? You can look at that and you think, okay, what is that, right? It's a lot of numbers. But what it really is, is an 18 by 18 pixels of a person, a very small person, by the way. That's not me. But all those values make up that image. And so just like these pixel art kits that you guys have probably worked on in the past, right? A pixel makes up an image. Every pixel goes into making that up. You can see the discrete beads that go in here to make up whether it's a Pokemon or a bird. And uh, But that's how you make an image. You use pixels to make up images. And each of those pixels have a value uh, a, a number behind it that tells the computer what to make that color, what color to make that pixel when it's displaying that. So that's really important when it comes to displays, really important when it comes to um, how we use data, how we use images. Um, if anybody goes into the computer science field and starts to do image processing, you'll see lots and lots of numbers because all those numbers behind the images are what you actually work with. Um, and because that that's what computers work with. Computers work with numbers. And that's how that's how they work. They have to use numbers to do their thing. And that's what you write uh, numbers. You use those numbers and math equations to do that image processing. So, right? So back to our daisy, right? You know, every uh, picture here is a millions and millions of pixels formed by million millions of photons uh, being detected. And they go into making up uh, these individual pixels. And every pixel has those three numbers behind it, right? Um, I'm not going to go into that, but you know there's you know there's brightness, there's color, and there's how much uh, uh, what they call saturation. But uh, so those numbers are what people use to do image processing. When you're photoshopping or you're doing work or the green screen that you see with weather people, those all use those three values to do that work and to fool around with images. So now I'm going to talk about the opposite effect. What happens when a photon hits an atom and, and actually knocks one of those electrons loose, right? Just like an electron can move from a, a higher energy state to a lower energy state and release a photon. Right, you can have a photon come in and hit an electron and knock it out. Right, once you knock it out, what do you do with that kicked out atom? Right, what do you what, excuse me? What do you do with that kicked out electron? Right, now you've got an electron that's been kicked out. What do you do with that? Right, there are lots of things. This is how CCDs or digital cameras work. Digital cameras, like we talked about, have millions and millions of little detectors. Each of those detectors collect the photons, and when those uh, photons are kicking loose electrons, they kick them out of the atom, then the, the digital camera here counts up those electrons, right? And then that's what how forms an image by counting up all those electrons that kick, kick, kicked out. So, and then the computer will take all those individual pixels and form them together into an image that you see like that daisy or like me on the screen or like the, the presentation that you're seeing in front of you, right? That's the computers taking all those numbers and putting them together in an image that we can see. What else can you do with the, uh, L, these, all these electrons that are kicked out? Well, when there are millions and trillions and billions of photons coming from the sun, we can put them to work with solar panels, right? We've got all those billions and trillions of uh, photons. They all knock electrons out of these solar panels. Um, and once they get knocked out of the solar panels, we can collect them, not to make an image, but to generate power, right? And we collect all those electrons up, and then we collect, collect them together, and then we can start to use them to light light bulbs, or to keep our house warm, or to run our computers. And uh, But that's really how solar panels work. They work from that photoelectric effect. The photons come in, they knock electrons out, and then we collect those electrons together and put them to work. 
So, and that is pretty darn cool. So, but, and I'm sure some of you have seen solar panels. There may be some solar farms around you. Uh, there's certainly other uh, alternative energy there. So I just, just got done talking to you about light as a particle. So is light a wave or a particle? What do you guys think? Is it a particle? Do you, did I convince anybody that light is a particle now? Is it a wave or a particle? I say both. All right, let's listen up. It's both. Well, the fun thing is, is that it's both. Sorry to be the spoiler here. Light is both. And it, and it's very kind of weird quantum mechanics physics thing that uh, um, depending on how you measure it, depends, we, gives you the result, whether it's a wave or a particle. Um, and that's what's fun about optics. That's what got me interested. Among the many things that got me interested in optics is the fact that it's both, right? If I'm counting photons, and making solar energy, then it's a particle. But if I'm doing something that uses polarization or frequency, uh, working with the frequency of light, then it's a wave and I can do different things with it. And that's what's neat because it makes it so many of the technologies that we see today possible because of that, both the dual nature of light. It's both a wave and a particle. So that's what's so much fun about it. That's what's fun. And I hope that you got something too. And I wanna do one more um, optical illusion with you. So on this one, we're gonna stare at this one for a minute. Uh, I'm gonna give it 20 seconds or maybe a little bit longer. Stare at that middle of that. Keep staring at that. And when I stop the video, you're gonna look at the person next to you and see how much their head has expanded with this, all this information that I gave you today. All right, look at the person next to you. I hope you're seeing their head expand. <laughs> so, I hope that you enjoyed some of the uh, optical illusions and some of the fun about optics. There are so many things that I didn't get a chance to talk to you about, whether it's uh, um, lasers and holography and lots of other fun things that you can explore on your own. I really, what I really want to do is uh, uh, encourage you to look around, to um, to observe, to say why and question. Right? Question: Why does that happen that way? And once you start to question that way, start to dig into it, find out why. And because uh, that's what makes things interesting. It's not just, you know, observing, right? But question, question everything, question why things happen, and then start to get interested in things, why things happen. So thank you. Um, and I I think I've got plenty of time for questions. Hopefully this works out. So yeah, absolutely. And so th that's what we'll do now. So if we have any questions, we'd love to invite students out to ask questions, or if, if for any reason that's difficult, you can always put questions in the chat. Um, but yeah, we'd love to see if the students have any questions about any of the stuff in the presentation or just to Joel in general. Okay, if you have a question, please raise your hand. If you would like to ask the expert a question, Austin, come on up, come up, ask the question. Uh, everyone, come on up, come closer. <laughs> Ask the question. How is light a wave and um, a particle? How is it both, right? So it's both because um, it depends on how you measure it, right? What light really is, is energy, right? And so it can be both a particle and a wave because it depends on how you measure it. That's one of the uh, great mysteries of quantum mechanics. When you do physics in high school, you'll learn a little bit more about that. But it's energy. That's really what it is. And so depending on how you measure it, it becomes either you either see it as a wave or you see it as a particle. So I hope that helps answer your question. You're really, it's, it's, it's the way things are. So <laughs> <laughs> it's a hard question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 
Tyler. Okay, so I have another question. Is there a way you can like hand make light or like make the type of atoms or like um the light it shows like with your hands or something? Like create it? Yes, yes. There are lots of ways to create light. I've seen people who make gloves with LEDs on it. So as they move their hands, um, they're lighting up the LEDs. Um, but you can also um, make the color of light very specific based on the type of atom you use or the type of material you're using to make the LED light. Um, LEDs come in all kinds of colors. And uh, that's kind of, you know, how big is that energy jump that the electrons are doing makes that color of light. So, and, and by changing the way the electrons are ejected from the, or absorbed, so they emit light, um, you can actually animate, you can do what they call modulation is the engineerical term. Um, modulate that light to, so to do different things, whether it's blank or go faster or slower or whatever. Yeah, go ahead, Jen Moore. Okay. okay, Chris, what is your question? Uh, my question is, if uh, white is every color, is black no color? Black? Yeah, so. <laughs> oh, excellent. So, and again here, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to say it depends a little bit on how you're measuring things, right? So black, um, when you're in a room and everything's black, it's the absence of light, right? When you're looking at a screen, um, it's a little different uh, because the, uh, um, whether you're looking at things that are reflective or transmissive, it depends. The, there's a little bit of a different answer there, depending on how you're looking at it, right? So lights, uh, when a light is black, uh, not a black light, that's something different. But when a light is off, right, it's the absence of light. When you've got a black piece of paper, it's absorbing all of the light. And so that's why it looks black, because it is absorbing everything. Okay. So, yeah, so white is reflecting everything. Black is absorbing everything. Maybe that's a better answer for you. Thank okay. you. Hey, Carly. Um, is it like, is it like when you're born, is it not possible to have like the spirals that are connected to your eyes? Or is that like a knee? So, yeah, I'm not sure I'd want to walk around with spirals in front of my eyes, but. Uh, <laughs> like it, inside your head. So the, uh, it is your, and it, and part of that with this way that at spiral um, optical illusion works is because your brain is processing that data. It get used to, it's, it, it kind of remembers that that spiral is going around and around and around. And then when you stop looking at that spiral, your brain says, okay, everything's still going around. So I'm gonna make everything else still go around. And uh, that's what makes your face either expand or contract um, after you look at that for a few seconds. So it's in your brain and it's because your brain remembers what your eye is seeing and it tries to continue to process it. So. It works really well when we were, we were um, uh, it worked re really well out in nature when we were looking for something to hunt or to a grain to pick or something like that, right? To look for something that changed. When you see something change, then your eye works very well to detect that change. But the fact that we can make that optical illusion based on that, uh, the way the eye works and your brain works is pretty fun. So does that help? Yeah, thank you, Carly. Thank you, Carly. Um, the spiral, whenever it's going, what does it do to people? Whenever you look at your, like somebody next to you. So it's your brain remembering what the spiral is doing, right? And so it builds up that memory of what the spiral is doing. So when you look at something else, then your brain says, okay, that spiral is still going, but wait, it's not. And you kind of fool your brain. So it doesn't actually um, do anything to people's eyes, you it just fools your brains into thinking that something's moving, right? It's kind of like when you're watching something that's flying away from you. When it's flying away from you, you think it's gonna keep going. Uh, or when it's coming towards you, you think it's gonna keep coming. And so you're fe fooling your brain into thinking that something's moving either towards you or away from you, which is why either things tend to get smaller or things tend to get bigger because you're fooling your brain into thinking that something's moving. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Brick. 
Um, if the um, lights made, if the lights made from the heat, and the heat made from energy, how is the energy made, and how does the particle look like? So the particle looks <laughs> incredibly, incredibly small. But to answer part of your question, where the energy comes from, it comes from the sun or it comes from um, uh, a energy plant. It could be from uh, a waterfall. Or it could be from a wind, wind turbine or it could be from burning coal. Um, so there are lots of ways to make energy and where we transmit it through copper wires. Um, and then we can use it for things like making light, it's light or light bulbs work um, when we, once we have that energy. And does that help you answer your question? Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Light is wave and a particle. Is it physically possible that light can be just a wave and light can also just be a particle? Yes, yes. And you know, there are experiments that scientists have done for hundreds of years just about to say, is it a particle or is it a wave? And they'll they'll do an experiment where it actually, they say, it's a wave. And then somebody else will do an experiment and say, no, it's a particle. And uh, and much like you saw in the presentation today, this photoelectric effect says that it's absolutely a particle. But, uh, um, and then the experiments, which are like very much like making holograms is clearly a wave, right? When you make a hologram, which I'd love to talk to you about in the in the future, it's very much a uh, wave. But uh, the fact that it's both means that it's really fundamentally light is energy. Uh, and when light is energy, it can be either way, either depending on how you measure it, uh, it's either going to be a particle or you're going to see it as a wave. So the fact that it's energy is really what you have to remember, not that it's a particle or a wave. So that's that question. Um, I'm the adult here. I just had a question. <laughs> okay. Is yeah. that why a hologram is there but not there? I'm sorry, one more time. Is that why a hologram is there but not there to our eyes? Um, so because holograms are made because of um um yeah, let's see uh, how to back how did how to explain your how a hologram yeah. <laughs> How to explain how the hologram is made in, in 10 seconds or less. So, <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. No, that's okay. So, a, a hologram is based on the fact that it's a wave, light is a wave, and the two waves interfere with each other, much like waves in a pond, right? When you have a wave in a water, those two waves come together and you'll see them either add up or subtract from each other. And that wave interaction was what forms the hologram on a photographic plate. And then when looking at it with uh, the same color light, usually a laser, you actually see a three-dimensional reconstruction because it's more than just the, the, the particle of the light making that plate. There's actually more information there. And that more information is what makes that hologram so cool. Uh, okay. Thank you so much. All right. Okay, that's actually a good question. Some animals are born blind. Um, there are like um, some cave fish, right? Don't have any eyes because they don't have, because they never needed eyes. They've always lead, lived in a dark cave. There are probably animals at the bottom of the ocean that yeah. never needed eyes. And so, and so they just, because they didn't need them, it become it became more of an advantage to not have them, and so that's why they don't have eyes. Um, so I'm not going to get in talking about biology; that's outside my expertise. Uh, but I'm hoping that that helps answer your question, right? Animals that use eyes tend to have them. Um, even like earthworms will have sensors to detect when the sun is out, and so they know they should get back underground. But uh, um, that is really a mechanism that they've developed so to avoid getting eaten by birds. So when the sun's up, they need to go back down to the ground. And so they can sense light, but they don't have eyes. Does that help a little bit? All right. Ah, so... Com why can't computers see color? I think that's your question, right? 
Okay, so color, computers can see color like the camera that I have in front of me, right? But it has to be careful, right? Typically, um, a computer sees all the colors all at once. And so you have to create a filter, a filter that sees maybe just red or a filter that sees just blue. And then when you combine that together um, and a filter that sees just green, right? Red, green, and blue. That's typically what a digital camera has, three filters on each of the pixels. And they combine that together to form the colors that you see on a computer screen, right? So uh, computers aren't that smart, really. They're just really good at math. And so you kind of have to tell it, here's, a, here's, here's how much blue there is, here's how much red there is, and here's how much, how much green there is. And once you tell it how much each of those colors are, it can put it together very quickly to say, hey, here's a red coat or a blue wall or whatever color or my gray hair. <laughs> so. Thank you. Last I'm sorry, I have a trouble hearing you. Can either Heather or uh, you repeat your question? Um, can they be that the light bulb transferred to the glass? Can you say that one more time? Or did you hear that? And then he, and one more time. I love the way that. Oh, the heat from the light bulb. Yeah. So that's actually uh, um, a really neat question. Um, light bulbs, like incandescent light bulbs, um, put out a lot of heat because it glows, right? That, that filament of the light bulb puts out a lot of heat heat that we can't see with our eyes. And so what good is it, right? It can heat up the room, it, yeah, who knows, right? And that's what's cool about LED lights is it's only producing light that your eye sees and not the heat. And so that's why LED lights are way more efficient and use less energy than an incandescent bulb because all that heat that the light bulb produces, the old light bulb produces, it just gets thrown away, right? It just goes away. It makes it too hard to change the light bulb because it's so hot. Does that help answer your question? All right. Are particles and waves the same thing? Are particles and what? Waves the same thing. So they're not exactly the same, right? The fact that uh, light is is energy. And uh, it can be both a particle and a wave, depending on how you use it. So, so it is. It's not. It's both, right? It's but it's really energy, right? And how you move energy around, right? Energy um, can move in a wire, like an electron, or it can be moved in a wave, like when you shout at somebody. Sometimes you feel uh, uh, actually a wave of air, right? A fan moving air is moving energy around. And uh, depending on, on what type of energy it is, it could be more like a particle or more like a wave. So really, if you think about how energy moves around, then you can start to see, hey, sometimes it's like this and sometimes it's the other way. So so there's uh, there's your challenge. Think about how energy moves around. Okay. Okay, here's our last question. Uh, Sarah would like to know why when you, the pencil was in the glass of water, why do our eyes uh, show it as broken or refractive. Right, right. So that's uh, that's really what refraction is, right? When the light is changing its angle. I wish I had a cup of water here in front of me, right? Um, all I've got is my magnifying lens here that uh, as, as, uh, um, as light goes through it, it bends. And then so when you're on the outside looking at it, right? All you see is that that light because it's been refracted as it goes through the water. Okay. So, but that's how lenses work, right? It bends the light, and that's really what makes optics work. So, good job. Well, we have learned so much today, and we really appreciate you um, coming and teaching us all about optics. Um, ladies and gentlemen, what do we? 
Time to say our wonderful speaker. Carlos, if I could, uh, Swain, if I could just uh, wrap it up. Uh, first, uh, let's give a huge round of applause to Swift School and the teachers and the students. I think that uh, the Swift School students get the award for the most questions that have ever been asked mm -hmm. on one of our virtual presentations. And we're just so grateful for that. And thank you students for all of your participation. And thanks also to, um, to uh, UTSA Cleese College, to Jill and to Carlos for their support. And also a big uh, uh, shout out for uh, Mr. Grimm and uh, MIT Beaverworks for just such a fantastic presentation. And then this has been recorded and will be posted uh, on the UTSA um, uh, social media and also on the D. Howard International for everyone to be able to see. And we're just so grateful for everyone's participation. You've just done such a great job. Uh, Ms. Williams, do you have anything else? I see you're back online there. Um, no, just thank you so much for working with us this morning with all of our technology issues as we've moved things around because um, we are in a rural part and internet and technology sometimes does not work how we're supposed to. Um, and we appreciate the presentation this morning. And we learned so much, even as teachers, we were looking at each other and kind of like, whoa, well, that makes sense now. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I have a, I'll just close it with, uh, for a, a question and a, uh, I guess two questions for Joel. Uh, with that thing about the uh, purple or uh, circles going around and then seeing a green dot. So I have a laptop open. And then I have a monitor, a larger monitor. I didn't see the green dot on the laptop. But when I looked at the same picture image on my monitor, which is a bigger screen, I saw the green dot. Why is that? Um, other, it, than, other than I'm an old man and <laughs> I can't see so well. But, but leaving that aside, uh, uh, is there a reason? Um, your laptop monitor might display fewer colors. And because it displays fewer colors, um, it won't have the same brightness or saturation that you would have on the larger monitor. And that's a very important aspect to be able to see that green disc flying around is how saturated, how deep that color is of the purple. Um, and uh, it is, there's a very finely tuned, believe it or not, and it doesn't work on all monitors. But it's, that's an important aspect to get that um, optical illusion to work. So maybe we'll leave this for another presentation, hint, hint. But uh, I, mean, uh, I heard on the news recently about in astronomy that they discovered something that was like 450 million years after the Big Bang and that they saw it. So when we are seeing stars, for example, are we are is what we're seeing what's happening now or what happened a long time ago? You're seeing fossilized light, if I use that phrase. So the light that you're seeing right now is light that is if that if that star is four light years away, like Alpha Centauri. That light that you're seeing today is something that happened at Alpha Centauri four years ago. So when you're looking back at some of those L, um, things that happened at the beginning of the universe, you're looking at really, really old light. And uh, that's how long those photons have been traveling before somebody caught them in a telescope. So how, how fast does light travel? And what, about, that's the last question. 
Okay, about 3 million miles, excuse me, 3 million meters per second. Right. And, uh, yeah, you know, here's another experiment. Well, it would be really fun to do is measure the speed of light because you can do it if you're careful. All right, we'll leave it at that. Thank you all. I know that uh, everyone has something else to do. We appreciate everyone's participation and uh, hope to do it again soon. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you.